<laughs> this is great. The, the WikiLeaks just sent out that one, the, this one tweet from the OSB projects. Ah, yeah, OSB projects, y'all. This is from the CIA's own documents. You know we got all the dankest Trojans. <laughs> No, I didn't see that. That's amazing. Oh, <laughs> there it the is. Yeah, I've ever read <laughs> the dankest Trojans. Wow, you know they we got, got all the dankest, dankest Trojans. Trojans. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Oh Man, my god, I'm gonna work for the CIA now. Yeah, well, maybe the, maybe that's why they got some good hackers. They're actually they're fun on the inside. I mean, sure, on the outside they're all about killing and droning, but on the inside they got the dankest Trojans. <laughs> got the dankest Trojans. <laughs> This is Linux Unplugged, episode 187, for March 7th, 2017! Oh, welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's very well traveled this week with stories from all abound. My name is Chris. My name is Wes. Hello there, Wes! You look very dapper today, sir. Oh, thank you all. It is... A big show. Oh, yeah. So Huge. much stuff. We, of course, as has been tradition for now three weeks in a row, are going to start with some Wolf Blitzer style breaking news. We're going to get all Blitzer up in here, cover some big news and how it applies to Linux. Everybody's talking about oh, yeah. it this week. Then Mr. Brian Lunduk will stop by the show. He's actually secret. Spoiler. Already here. What? Going to talk a little bit about the last, the final Linux sucks. It's an end of an era. We'll get the inside scoop on what's going on. I suspect it's all about his hairdo. Now, later on in the show, we're going to hear from Mr. Wimpy and Mr. Popey about their trip to Mobile World Congress. Nice. And then if that's not enough, if that's not enough, like, you know, we got a little scale in there, a little Mobile World Congress, we're going to get you amped up about Og Camp 17. What? Then we're going to warp back to scale. We're going to go to the GNOME booth and talk to the GNOME guys about some of the stuff they've been working on, why they like Endless OS, the new Endless OS PC, I think it's called The Mission. Yeah, I think so. Noah got to see it. He got to talk to the guys Ooh. at the booth. We're going to play an interview from that. And then, at the end of the show, new piece of hardware touting elementary OS by default. Hey. However, the elementary OS project, super silent on the issue. Kind of like they don't want any attention on it. And the hardware looks like it might be a bit of a scam. Not uh -oh. sure exactly what's going on. But producer Michael's been following the story from the very beginning, asking questions, getting the inside scoop. So we'll dig into that and talk about the light, or I'm sorry, the little light, I think it's called, the light book, which is a $250 Linux laptop. Is it too good to be true? A $250 Linux laptop preloaded with elementary OS. But before we can get into any of that, we must say hello to our virtual lug. Time appropriate greetings, Mumble Room. Hip hip. Hello. Hello. So everyone, it is a big news day today, and it's if you've been following any of the news had any of the news outlets. I mean, they're all just I'm sure just Everywhere. talking about it in great detail. Well, maybe a little bit of detail, maybe maybe not it's as a, much a detail. Smidgen. Yeah. So it's up to us then. It's, it's up to us. It is it is our duty to go Wolf Blitzer on this. We're gonna do a little breaking news right here on the show. This is CNN breaking news. So this morning, a little earlier than expected, Richard Stallman was once again proven correct. Uh, in fact, this isn't even, I don't have to point this out, WikiLeaks tweeted this. GNU founder Richard Stallman's famous quote resonates today at WikiLeaks publication. With software, there are only two possibilities. Either the users control the program or the program controls the users. If the program controls the users and the developer controls the program, then the program is an instrument of unjust power. Now, I, this, is, this is sort of a pungent, is that the right word? A pungent smells a little bad? It's really, you know, you never like to hear this because, you know, everybody has, well, except for I, I want to be able to play games or, well, except for I want to be able to record video in sure. ProRes or except I want to be able to make phone calls on my iPhone. Everybody has these, these little accepts where they don't want to give on this particular quote. And then something happens. It seems like every, cu every couple of months and this quote comes back up and it's more right and more true and more correct than ever. And it just stings. It just tastes bad a little bit because like, damn it. Damn it, he's right. He might eat toe jam, but he is right. Today, WikiLeaks revealed Vault 7, a whole batch of CIA crap. Yeah, like almost 8,000. Yeah, yeah, over 8,000. Oh, over over 8,000 documents, Wes. <laughs> and uh, it, has, uh, it has been dubbed the Year of Zero. Yeah, Year Zero, 
which is uh, probably in reference to all of the zero-day exploits that are contained in this. So there is actually something in here that's a little applicable to Linux. I'm going to save the most, you know, most of this for Unfilter or TechSnap or wherever, wherever it may lie as we go through it. But one thing I thought was interesting, and it just came out today, is the CIA has malware that is pretty sweet because it can target Windows, OS X, Linux, or some hardware routers. It's called Hive. And it's a multi-platform automated malware attack and control system. Oh, also Solaris. Shouldn't I shouldn't yep, forget yep. Solaris. And uh, it uh, it's also related to the Cutthroat and Swindle tools. Wow. First of all, I love the names: Cutthroat, Swindle, yeah, Hive. Totally love the name. I think all of this is great. Uh, and it goes into more detail. In, in fact, they have, and I have these linked in the show notes, guides on how to use this. Developer guides, end user it's guides. Pretty nice documentation, really. Good information about how, how ICMP uh, pings and air, ICMP yep. errors work, and which ISPs might reject them. Quite fascinating, actually. They've done some good work here. Uh, it's it's remarkable to read through this and go, oh, okay, so everything you kind of suspected is probably true. That conspiracy that you thought was totally out there and crazy now looks like it's more and more true every day. There was soft. There they have supposedly tools in here that help them target computer systems and cars. Oh, yeah, totally. That's something a lot of people have suspected before. Uh, Mr. Lunduk, you and I were talking about this before the show. Anything about, anything in the uh, Vault 7 leaks, Brian, uh, jump out at you as either preposterous or fascinating in the context of Linux or just worth noting? There's only really one thing that's worth noting in all of this, and that is that the CIA has the dankest Trojans, <laughs> Yes, <y'all>. yeah. <laughs> I love that. That is that is true, <laughs> and you can't deny it now. I mean, if they didn't, they, would they be doing their job? They right? make the NSA look like a bunch of middle schoolers, right? They do. I mean, come on. CIA is like, we want our own exploits. We're not going through those guys, giving them our operational deets. This is how the CIA talks, because yeah, right. they're soup's oh, yeah. hip. They're soup's hip. So they go out there, go where to totes get our own zero days, and they're going to be the dankest zero days. They're kind of talking like Trump a little bit. <laughs> it's a little Trumpian in it the way. It filters down. <laughs> This is all all new relevant stuff too. Uh, from 2013 to 2016 is. Wait the, a minute! Uh, wait a minute, Chris Christopher Fisher. Yeah. I gotta call you out for a second here. Go for it. No, I'm not the biggest Trump fan in the world, but I don't believe I've ever heard Donald Trump get up on stage and say, "Damn, that is dank, right. y'all." Uh, I would like that, but I don't believe he's done that. So I'm gonna call Shannon. Can we wait and right hope? There. I mean, maybe it's we, only just started. We we, we totally can. It's the first hundred days, man. It's the first hundred days, so you never know. <laughs> that's I, that's the second hundred day plan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's the new distraction. Uh, so yeah, 2013 to 2016 is where this documents are from. Uh, it sounds like they got it essentially because people were passing this stuff loosey goosey around the government at this point, and so people inside the government got it over to WikiLeaks. They've uh, been sitting on it for a little bit. There was some discussion in the last few weeks. I think it was even just oh, last week. Julian Assange said they would get it released sometime this year, but they were going it through. Quick. They were redacting not just names and some dates now, but they're also redacting portions of code, mm-hmm. which is an interesting thing they have to do. To uh, avoid easily weaponizing the information, at least. This is part one of this was obtained recently and covers through 2016. Details on the other parts will be available uh, later on. And then in there, this is amazing. So they're not just creating malware for Linux, but they're also using Linux to hack Macs. And they have a guide on how you can use Ubuntu or Mint, whichever you prefer. User's choice. Yep. CIA hacker's choice. Mint or Ubuntu, but uh, at least, let's be honest, at least it's uh, gonna something that supports snap packages, like a gentleman. And uh, they say in here you can configure uh, EF, the uh, Linux or Ubuntu Mint install to hack the UEFI firmware on a Mac. That's actually pretty neat. Yeah, and they have, uh, they have apparently they have their own internal repos. And they even look. They even have instructions on using. Here, this covers using GCC. This is this is the CIA's documentation on using GCC to build hacking tools on Linux. Yep. <laughs> or the UEFI driver wizard. Yeah, yeah. This is this is what it is here. Huh. It's it's it, a long page. Though. Like this is pretty legit documentation. That's really kind of a mess. Look at this. They even have a little GUI. Like a look at that. It's with the with yeah, the like uh, screenshots with and... the default Ubuntu theme there. Ubuntu's everywhere now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's really popular. (laughs) 
Well, when you're hacking at home and you're hacking at the office, you want to be on the same platform. Yeah, that's true, right? It makes it much easier when you're building. In, and also, they talk about using uh, public VPSs for the command and control servers to make it even more confusing. They talk about tools that intentionally leave, quote unquote, fingerprints that look Russian or whatever else they want. Mm-hmm. This is really, it's a really big treasure trove of stuff. But the one thing that I thought was interesting was this Hive thing, just in context of this show. Uh, it's a multi platform malware suite and control software. The project provides customizable implants for Windows, Solaris, Microtech routers, and that Linux platforms. Yeah. Yeah, it also has a listening post, which is what they call it, the command and control infrastructure to communicate with these implants, is what they call the, the Trojan, is an implant. The implants are configured to communicate via HTTPS with a web server on the domain that they've chosen, which is usually like a cover domain of some kind. And each operating... The each, each operation utilizing these implants has separate cover domains, and infrastructure can handle any number of cover domains. So you can have one server for the command and control, but appear to be hundreds of domains on one VPS if you want it to be. Each cover domain resolves to an IEP address that is associated with a commercial, commercial VPS provider, and the public-facing server forwards all incoming traffic via a VPN to a blot, not a bot, but a blot server that handles actual connection requests from its clients. I don't know why it's blot, not bot, but apparently it's this little server that sits there and handles the incoming connections, manages it. It's set up for optional SSL if you want, uh, if the client has a valid cert. It can do that. Um, and it says it's forwarded to a honeycomb tool server that communicates with the implant how about these words here, huh? If a valid certificate is missing, the traffic is forwarded to a cover server that then delivers it via an unsuspicious-looking website. Interesting. The Honeycomb tool server receives exfiltrated information from the implant, and an operator can also also task an implant to execute jobs on the target computer, so the tool server acts as a command and control server for the implant as well. Now, there is a bit of a downside if you manage to infect a Windows box. At the time of this write-up, didn't support automatic client update on Windows. Uh, yeah. However, Linux rig can totally Boom. remotely update the implant. Totally good to go. <laughs> Just got a cron job, updates in the background, easy peasy. Yeah. It is. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is. Poby, did you have, I saw, I saw you go by. Did you have something you wanted to jump in with? No, I just thought, you know, the fact that they're using like Ubuntu or whatever Linux distribution is interesting, but I wondered if they'd used uh, anything that uses the JSON license, given that their license explicitly says the software shall be used for good, not evil, mm. and whether whether that would be a, a way in which we could legally go after them for using the software. Well, you know, I was also reminded of the uh, VMware lawsuit, because there is some use of BusyBox. In here, they you, they bundle BusyBox with some of their tools, which made me wonder if maybe they're violating the BusyBox license. Which has gotten VMware in trouble before. Wouldn't that be hilarious? It'd be like the Al Capone of the CIA. Yeah, it really would be the BusyBox license. Yeah, I saw some discussion of how like they couldn't. Some of the stuff isn't classified because because of the command and control nature. For instance, if it was transmitted or put on a machine that wasn't couldn't have classified information. Oh, wow. Analysts could be fired or disciplined because it would be breaching the protocol for classified information. What a so what an interesting catch-22. Like, they can't, like, you, you know, leaked classified. It wasn't classified. Wow, I, I did not catch that part. That is that is particularly interesting. It's been, it's been really interesting also, speaking of things that, guess what, are interesting. Reading Edward Snowden's uh, Twitter feed today, um... I think he's right, and he says the big story is this is the first public evidence that the U.S. government is secretly paying to keep U.S. software unsafe. So they they discover they they even they have teams that discover these vulnerabilities, or they buy the known vulnerability off of um, someone or a, some trading site. They discover these things that are critical to devices that the American public has in use every day that they're doing God knows what with, and they're not disclosing it. They're leaving these flaws open, nothing preventing another foreign government from discovering or buying the same flaw and taking advantage of it. Instead of working, the sort of the story that came out after the NSA leaks was, well, we, yeah, we hold on to those zero days for a while, and then we inform the Microsofts and the Apple of the right. world about them. Oh, except for these really important ones. Okay, we don't tell them about those either. But otherwise, we totally work with them. And then Microsoft even came out with a statement saying, we do have a program that works with the NSA where they discover vulnerabilities and we have included uh, vulnerabilities they've informed us about in previous patch sets. Like they just talked about, like it was the standard operating procedure. And you're like, oh, okay, well, this is just something that the private sector and the government have set up working together. Nothing wrong with that. Sure, what could go wrong? Right. No problem. Sure. 
Then you see this and you discover, oh, no, no, no. They have a huge treasure trove of zero days, hundreds of them, actually, and they just don't tell anyone. And they just use them for their own benefit and just, I guess, hope. They just kind of hope that nobody else figures out these vulnerabilities exist. They just kind of hope it's all going to work out. It seems that way. I mean, I guess we were supposed to assume or trust that they are weighing that risk versus the intelligence advantage of having these zero days. But is that really the case? I don't know. And that, I guess that's something maybe we can analyze now that we have these documents. Is it also mean that people are more likely to start digging into what these are now that they know they're out there? Yeah, hopefully. All right. Anyone in the mumble room have any closing thoughts on their story before we move on? Probably not. It's not very interesting. No, no. Okay. No. All right. Well, speaking of things that are interesting. Yeah, uh, days, we actually have a couple of these options. Are you- whoa. Whoa. Did you hear whoa. that voice right there? That was the that was the up the nose shot of one Mr. Brian Lundu. It's a nice nose. And he is holding Word. his final, the last, there will be no other. Whoa. Linux sucks talk. It's scale 15x this year. And Brian. Yeah. I just want to say. As somebody who's you know been around when these started, I think <laughs> yeah, this was a long time ago. <laughs> this was your best hairstyle out of any Linux sucks talks you've ever given. I think you really nailed it this year. Why? Well, well, thank you. I did a full and complete re- retrospective of all of the various hairstyles because I felt like that was probably the most important thing to talk about. That's why people would Linux be tuning talks. in. Sure. Yeah yeah. 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 Most definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. It was pretty fun. It was good. It was the last one I'm ever gonna do. We did it on Thursday night at scale. It was rad. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I was able to watch some of it. I was watching live because I didn't get to go to scale this year. Uh, and man, was that live stream rough. That was oh, man. that was rough. Yeah, that, that was, was pretty brutal. But you know, it's it's conferences. Con- the conference live streams and recordings always they always kind of suck. Like even yeah. the big ones yeah. from like the big festivals yeah. with like a tons of corporate backing. They're mm-hmm. always pretty rough. It's hard to get right. So the number one question everybody asks now is: So what's the deal? Does Linux no longer suck, or do you just get tired of doing it? Oh no, it still sucks. It's just the same <laughs> thing every time. You remember, Chris? Remember, remember when we first started doing those back in what year was that? Two thousand, two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Yeah, we started doing those. Remember the first three years I did it? It was like the same slides every friggin' year. Yeah, like like it was the exact same slides. And part of it is because I'm the laziest bastard on the planet. But part of it was that it was like the same stuff to complain about every year. I, you know, after after almost a decade of complaining about essentially the same things, at, at one point you got to just like wrap it all up, put a bow on that and say, there, everyone just go reference that video until it's all fixed and then we can revisit. <laughs> there, it's, it's all, it's now enshrined. Here it is. This is the final yeah. version. Fix these things. Fix yeah, these things. That. Go do that right there. Because <laughs> that's worked so well uh, since 2009. It's obviously... <laughs> It's played out perfectly. It's a winning damn strategy, my friend. Now, did you find that it was, there was trepidation early on, trepidation, I guess, early on? Do people a little leery of having somebody come out to their Linux event and talk about how Linux sucks? Because I could see some people not getting the right, you know, not getting the inside joke. Well, remember, we, when we did the first one, we did it up at Linux Fest Northwest, and we didn't call it Linux Sucks. We called it Linux Sucks and what we can do to fix it. We actually <laughs> made a very big deal about how this was a positive thing. It wasn't just about complaining and whining. And then once once that kind of was successful, we were able to drop that whole sh- charade mm-hmm. off and just focus on the sucky stuff. No more couching. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, but then after a while, I mean, I mean, after, I mean, after the videos start getting a million views, I mean, people are like, oh, okay, yeah, you can, you can come here and, and give my conference a ridiculous amount of press. Yes, that's fine. Yeah, and it <laughs> so seems it to always, okay. it always seems people see that, you know, and even if they haven't seen the video before, you see it on the program, you're like, what? What is this? Right? Who is this guy? And what could he say? And so, you know, it's yeah. a, it's a either good... you know about it or you're upset. And you're like, I'm gonna go. Yeah, the only thing I so there, I feel like there's probably two possibilities. Uh, either you've thought of another way to get attention that's going to be even better than saying Linux sucks, or you're rolling the <laughs> dice and assuming you're just going to figure one out. Which one is it? A uh, little bit of both, maybe. <laughs> oh, so there could uh, be something in the works. There, there might be. And I, if there were, I would choose to be very sneaky about it and not say anything until at least Linux Fest Northwest rolls around. There you go. Yeah, Linux. There's a good There's a good plug, too, for Linux Fest Northwest. So I will yeah, have Yeah, I will be there. You'll be up there this year, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Hey, hey, I'm going to live there for a couple of days. <laughs> you know, you know I, I've heard that you're good at, at using your words and talking. Perhaps. You're going you to give a speech? You're going to give a session? You're going to get up in front of a crowd this time at Linux Fest? Maybe. Uh, you, know how, you, you know how much Come I on. hate crowds. You know me and... You know me and Come uh, on. 
It would depend. Maybe if Wes could fill in for me at the I'll booth for what. a bit. Oh. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. what. Chris, I will do one with you. What would we do and talk me, about? What would we talk about? I, I don't even fucking care. We can get up there and talk about shoes for all I care. We'll get up there. You give me something good to talk about, I'd do it. I mean, you I just, you know. Shoes? I got nothing shoes? to talk about because I talk, shoes? I talk way too much during the week. So what, do I, what else do I got to say? <laughs> right? So I feel like it's all in the shows. But if you gave me something new to riff on, I could do it. Man, people would love it, dude. Right? People would get a serious kick. I, I don't even care what it is. If, if people in the mumble room, the audience of this show, whatever, tell Chris what you would like me and Chris to, to talk riff about on Linux or, Fest yeah. Northwest mm-hmm. yeah. for one hour, mm-hmm. and we'll do it. Yeah. Although I'll do it. I'll I, be there. I think. Potatoes. I think. I think with this audience, it could I mean, be kind of potatoes. random. Yeah. I was gonna say potatoes could be. Yeah. <laughs> no. See, I did. I did potatoes for like half an hour at the at the. Oh yeah. <laughs> the stuff, so I, I got to come up with something more esoteric than potatoes this mm. time around. Okay. Well, maybe we'll see. We'll see what people say. Let us know. Maybe something. Something really right? gripping. Yeah. Gripping. We got it. We got, we should do something. Technically, the the call for papers is already closed, but I'm sure we could squeeze something in, man. They, they'd get a kick out. We'll of just that. go take over a room. Yeah. I mean, if we walk right. in there with cameras and microphones and lights, people are probably going to get out of our way. So Right? They'll move. Either way, it's content. <laughs> you could almost do the history of Linux Fest Northwest. Could almost you do could. that. I just don't really think that would be... I don't know. You'd have to have... I don't know. See, there'd have to be like years of... No, that's boring. Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. We got to do something rad, something gripping, something that really grabs you by your cockles and just gives it a good yank. <laughs> I think we can do it. We can, How about let's do stop using Ubuntu? Well, well, that that actually could get some attention. Stop using <laughs> Ubuntu. It's really not that much different than the Linux sucks, sucks <laughs> honestly. That's pretty much the gist of it. <laughs> so we'll have uh, the uh, the final Linux sucks talk. It's it, up. Yeah, 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 yeah. The final the final one was out. Uh, yeah, just got released. Couple days ago. Was it yesterday. Yeah, okay. yesterday. Yesterday, oh yeah, yeah. Less less than twenty four hours ago. Uh, All right. So we'll we'll see how that one does. Find uh, that on Brian's channel. I'll also have that linked in the show yeah. notes if you guys want to check it out. It's also in the subreddit. So and there too. and there is. I don't know if you saw this, Chris, but <laughs> one of my favorite shots from any of the Linux action shows or any of the videos that the we one ever with the flag. Together, the flag. One. I saw that. I, I did like, see that. I'm like, like, we got to use. That I'm like, one. I, I forgot about that. that. <laughs> I did too. I totally was that from coding with it. Brian though. That was from coding with Brian. No, no, that was just that was just the Linux Action Show. Remember, we recorded it. And you remember the year we went up to Linux Fest and we had like a classroom yeah. that we were going to stream live yeah. from the whole yep. time. Yep. And the internet sucked. Yep. And the audio was terrible. Yeah. And so we recorded a little intro with the American flag behind me where I was telling people oh, that, how bad the audio was. That wasn't That's, even green screen. That uh, was legit flag? No, 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 no. That was green screen. Oh, okay. We, we, we green screen. Oh, we that did green right, screen that. that okay. Was right after we got that green screen. That's that hilarious. Like, we, and we were like, we were just like farting around with it, <laughs> like trying to like do stuff. So we had like also the biggest, gaudiest American flag. Like, you know, how much better is that picture with that stash? I don't think it would have oh, the yeah. same. I don't think it would have the same landing if you didn't have that America. stash. America, <laughs> man, God. I am just eating beef in that picture, and I don't even have beef in that picture. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's the same jacket too. No scarf anymore, but it's the same jacket. Yeah, it was. It was. I realized that when I was up there, I grabbed the same blazer, the same brown corduroy blazer I had on, and that was I don't know, that was 2010, 2011, something like that. It was forever ago, dude. Yeah, but you're just now breaking it in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's just starting to get soft finally. Yeah, it's just so stiff. At yeah, first. you got this. You know, this is a forty year blazer here. You got it. It's just getting warmed up. <laughs> That's a particular category. <laughs> yeah, the forty year blazer. <laughs> All right, Mr. Lunduk. Well, I know you had to go around this time, so I do. I I, I hate to jump in here, be fantastical and jet sure, when I sure. know my, my my good friends Popey and Wimpy are in the, in the crowd. But guys, you're gonna you're gonna have to do something rad without me. Uh, you guys carry on. Do somehow awesome things. Somehow yes. they will manage. You, you'll manage, I bet. Well, thank you for stopping by, and congrats on uh, a long run of the Linux sucks. Talks. The Linux sucks. Yeah, not not too damn shabby. Also, I was looking at it, and if anyone wants to see early camera work from Chris Fish, no, you don't. Ooh. Oh my God! Go back. <laughs> don't so do it. The the first year or two, we had a tripod, and then like the third year, we did it. We were just like, man, eh, it. I, we're just I, gonna hold it. Yeah, you know what I don't understand is like. How come we never got that dialed in? Like, I mean, even now you're still never shooting up your did. face right here. <laughs> you never did. Oh, you want to know? It's crazy. So this year, right? This year we had a sponsor for it. We had really good cameras set up for it. Uh, so we had four cameras set up. Whoa. Two of them came out awful. Like it was yeah. nice DSLRs. They yeah. recorded it. The image quality was good, but like the shots were just bad. <laughs> like it was just terrible. The one great, like good looking one. It's just like this like webcam that's like up my nose. <laughs> yep. Yeah, <laughs> it's we great. It's always it's always like, something. It's always something. Yeah. 
I feel like that's the style of Linux sucks, though. Like, that's its <laughs> thing. Like, we had, because we recorded two completely separate years on those old N900 camera phones, those old yeah. N900 phones, yeah. just with some guy sitting in the audience, really nice guy, just sitting there holding it for a freaking hour. <laughs> and, the, and the battery didn't last very long on it, so we had to have an extension cable run so we could hold it there so it was charging over USB while he was holding this cheap, cheap little camera phone. And then that particular show goes on to get a, like a million Million, million yeah, go views. figure, right? Go yeah. figure. That, yeah. See, that's how you do it, Chris. You got to yeah. you got to go cheap cameras, yeah, cheap microphone, right? Make sure it's as bad as possible, okay? And then you get like a million views. Okay, I'm right. taking notes. I'm taking notes. Yeah, I'm yeah, gonna yeah, do yeah. it. I'm just you know a little bit of schooling, a little bit of schooling, help you out a little. Thank bit. Thank you. I appreciate Until that. You know. All right, I got it all. I'm gonna get rid of this microphone. All right, all right. Hey guys, hey guys, look behind you. What? Where'd he go? Well, there you go. We'll have that all linked up in the show notes. And uh, hey, Brian, you're still here. What are you doing? Don't you know how to work mumble? Close that thing. <laughs> Get out of here. Come on. All right. So before we go on, let's stop and thank Linux Academy for sponsoring this week's episode of the Unplugged program. So much more to get into. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. That's where you go to sign up, support the show, and free seven-day trial. What? What? That's amazing. That is me and my mind literally exploding at the awesomeness of this. You get into the platform, you can dig around and really figure out how Linux Academy might work for you. They have labs to give you hands-on, scenario-based learning, instructor mentoring when you need it, videos with self-paced, in-depth courses. Whether you're an experienced sysadmin or new to the world of Linux, Azure, and AWS, OpenStack, and DevOps, a sharp skill set is an absolute necessity to succeed. Meet Linux Academy, right. an online Linux and cloud training platform that uses self-paced video courses and hands-on labs to give you real-world experience for a wide range of skills. Train for your certification, learn the latest DevOps tools, and grow your skill set to do better work. Linux Academy is not just a video library. Our scenario-based server labs and quiz system allow you to learn hands-on. We also have full-time human instructors who answer questions Love that. and help you earn that certification yeah. or promotion at work. All right. We add new training every week, so you'll always be up to date on the latest tech. Sysadmins of every experience level use Linux Academy to stay on the bleeding edge of the Linux ecosystem. You should too. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. One of the things that I love about Linux Academy is they have a little breathing room now to engage with the community, and it's really exploding. I mean, they have a great community on their own, but they're now engaging with the wider Linux com community. They're going to a lot of these events. They like scale. They're at mm -hmm. scale. I'm hoping they go to Linux Fest. So that way we can get a chance to hang out with them. It's a company in, the, in a really sweet spot of growth right now. Not only are they doubling down, investing on their content and their staff and making your subscription more valuable all the time, but they're doubling down on their engagement with the community. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. And a big thank you to Linux Academy for sponsoring this here Linux Unplugged program. This one, this one right here. I want to give a, I want to move on. I want to talk about Mobile World Congress and uh, OggCamp, but maybe to uh, slide us into that, to prepare us, to get our bodies ready. Let's talk a little bit about the story of Firefox OS. I thought this was an interesting piece. And just this shot of the booth is really something. It really is, yeah. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that investment just right there. Now, you know, Canonical was just at Mobile World Congress. Mm -hmm. Massive booth. Really, oh, yeah. a house booger that crazy. Bigger uh, this booth, bigger than bigger than my house, bigger than maybe as big as the studio. It was a big ass, big ass, big ass booth. Uh, so I'd like to tell you this is uh, the guy writing this uh, from Firefox, from boot to gecko, all the way up to the software project dying in 2016. And he writes out where they went wrong. It's a, it's an interesting write up about Firefox mm -hmm. OS. I don't know if we need to spend a lot of time going into it, but I thought I would point it out to the audience who's curious about these these free software operating systems for mobile devices and maybe where they've gone wrong now that these folks involved, like this guy who was a product developer, have a little hindsight. Yeah, perspective. And can look back at it and go, well, where did we go wrong? Uh, so that's it's interesting from that perspective. Uh, now, I want to segue not so brilliantly into uh, Mobile World Congress where uh, Popey and Wimpy have just returned from. This is, this is a comparison that people will often make. Well, look at Canonical. They're investing so heavily in mobile, 
which is kind of like, well, mm-hmm. how do you how do you know where they invest their money? How right. do you know what, what are you how basing they, that on? What are you basing that? On? How do you know what returns they get from that? But anyways, it's a common criticism that you hear lobbied at them quite a bit, and they did indeed have a big presence. So I kind of wanted to get a little perspective from a couple of the booth babes. That, I mean, a couple of the guys that were there, Popey and Wimpy, what they thought of it all, and and sort of walking away from it. What is the reason Canonicals there? And I don't know. Maybe if I was going to go, what should I expect? So Popey, I'd, I'd love to start with you. Uh, I know that uh, I, I think following your Twitter feed, I saw I saw several different uh, tweets about about the event, about having fun. I'm guessing you must have had a great time. Yeah, it's my first time at MWC. I've never been there before, and I kind of had to ask around in the company to find out what to expect. But overall, it was an overwhelming experience, and I like the size of the place. I couldn't get over it. It was just humongous. Mm. So, so many halls. That uh, the whole building buildings were built specifically for MWC. Wow, it's it's just gigantic, and we had a sizable booth. I mean, you look at other people's booths, like the giant companies like Huawei and Nokia and and companies like that. They had really gigantic booths that were like the size of a town, huh. whereas ours was you know pretty big for a free software development company. <laughs> <laughs> you know, relatively speaking, a part of the town. Yeah, it was, a bit of, it was a bit comparable in size to LG, who were opposite us on the um, on the strip. Wow! Hey. Yeah. Wow! Okay, keeping up with the yeah. Joneses. So well, it wasn't it, it wasn't like we had a tiny little postage stamp size one compared to all the others. But what was really nice was like the diversity of stuff that was on the stand. It wasn't just here, come and get an Ubuntu CD, or here's a Ubuntu phone that you can't buy. You know, there was there's a there was a whole load of stuff, and it wasn't just canonical. It wasn't just Ubuntu. There was a whole load of partners there demoing stuff. And I I know while we were standing there demoing our stuff, that me and Martin were talking about there. There were just so many other things to see and do, which was great because people spent ages on the stand and <laughs> spent ages talking to us. Now, uh, Wimpy, I was curious from your perspective, this is a pretty big event where you're going and showing off some of the hard work of either yourself or teammates. Uh, was it, did you feel a bit on display? Was it, was it like, here's our hard work, what do you think? Or was it, was it a different vibe? Um, yeah, it was, to some extent, it was, here's what we've been working on. So specifically what Popey and I and our team uh, with Evan, uh, Jamie were was showing was all the new stuff to do with Ubuntu Core and Snaps. And we were introducing that to developers who were at MWC. Hmm. And it was interesting because those conversations went very differently from the conversations that you have with um, traditional open source projects. So um, software developers who just want their software out there and they want to get it on as many devices as possible, as easily as possible, the whole Snaps and Ubuntu core story really resonated with them and uh, the feedback was overwhelmingly positive. But then you're, you're saying, you know, Ubuntu has, from our, you know, fr- from the discussions we've had here, the Ubuntu mobile story has been about the phone and the tablet in the past. But going into this, what I've learned is just like the rest of the IT industry has embraced uh, virtualization and ca- containerization in order to get more value out of their servers and pack the most amount of functionality into the equipment that they've got deployed in places, the telecommunications sector are doing exactly the same thing. So they have been buying great big devices that have single purpose and single function, and these are very expensive uh, bits of kit but they are now moving to a software defined platform where they are rolling out their new era of networks based on OpenStack and software to define software defined radios software defined networks uh, virtual network function infrastructure mm-hmm. so it turns out that because ubuntu is the dominant platform in the cloud and supports OpenStack kubernetes and lexd transparently throughout the you know the stack of offerings that ubuntu has the telcos are queuing up to rework their internal infrastructure on Mm. ubuntu using those cloud technologies you know wes and i went to the open daylight summit that was was put on by the linux foundation i bet you were yeah because it was a lot of this it really was yeah exactly that a lot of uh data centers that look like 
there, there are multiple data centers that look like one flat network that is all spun up on demand. And different connections are created by software-defined networking. Now, they were hoping people would be using Open Daylight to manage it all or to, to – I guess it's like a not, network yeah. component yeah. of it anyway. But, uh, hmm, this is, you know, it's, it's big. It's a big, it's a big uh, infrastructure reorganization on the back end that's totally transparent to consumers. Yeah, exactly. And we don't, exactly. you don't even realize it's happening. I mean, we hardly know, and we're, we went we to an event. Be insiders. Yeah, yeah, we went to an event about it, and we, <laughs> we can hardly yeah. tell. And it's, you know, it's interesting to hear you uh, echo that, Wimpy, because it's, that's, a, that's exactly what we observed, too. And the and the driver for the telcos is that they're they're losing sort of they're losing the fight against the big cloud providers and the data centers of the world, mm. and they need to compete there. They need to be in that space, and that's why they're going to be using many of the same technologies to offer much of the same capability. Interesting, Poby, you were going to say something? No, it was just it was interesting to me that the people who were coming by the booth. Um, the way that MWC works on the first day, you get these scouts come by the by the booth, and these are scouts from some of the like biggest companies you've heard of, um, checking out what's on the booth and checking out the demos, and then they go away. And then the next day, on the Tuesday, they come back with their CEOs and CTOs and the execs to actually see the thing for themselves. And it was it was interesting to me to see these scouts going around and asking loads of questions and then coming back the very next day with different people alongside them to demo, um, you know, whatever it is, software defined radio or Ubuntu core or OpenStack or whatever. Um, and, and seeing our salespeople talking to their people hmm. was uh, was hmm. quite entertaining. <laughs> yeah. A, boy, wouldn't that be wouldn't that just be one more perfect industry for Linux to completely take yeah. over? Just and, and and not because, not because the bunch, not because they're like big Linux enthusiasts, but simply because it's solving a, a problem Practical for the problem. And the reason why I like that is it it forces these companies to get involved in a way that is beneficial to their long term viability. And once they get all in on something like this, Linux and all of this technology stack becomes part of that. Well, we have to we have to get involved. From a long-term viability standpoint, and Wes and I talked from I think it was two different people from AT and T, somebody from Ericsson. Uh, uh, where else? I know we talked to we talked to a, a wide range of companies that were getting involved in open source simply because they're now moving into this field. Yeah, it becomes the tool set that they use, and the way to get the easiest way and the best way for them to get the things that they need changed or fixed or improved is contribute to upstream. And the Linux Foundation is trying to figure out a way to, you know, kind of get in on this a little bit because they feel like, well, we should be there setting the standard, setting this, you know, so I, and I don't know if they're getting, I can't, I don't have a good sense if they've, if they've gotten a lot of traction. Did you guys see a lot about anything about Open Daylight or the Linux Foundation at Mobile World Congress? Nope. No. Ooh. Yeah, that seems like the event you'd be at though. One thing that I did see, like conversely, the flip side of the the, the big wigs and the execs and the scouts on the Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, they open the conference to local students who all come in. So it's a very different crowd. Oh, on interesting. Thursday. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Um, and we got rid the of a number lot of lanyards of, and stickers that day. We <laughs> a number of people who came by and told it like before we'd even talk to them about anything before we'd ask them any questions. They were like, yeah, I already use Ubuntu. It's on my awesome. machine at home. It was like. So many people every single day telling us how yeah they they use Ubuntu they love it people telling us they've got their Dell XPS in their bag and they carry it with them everywhere and stuff like that that really made it worthwhile going and seeing like and, the real people and not and not just not just the students coming in who are su- studying computer science but at the uh, the food stands because obviously we were all in Ubuntu Orange. You know, we were sure. full, 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 sure. full brand regalia. <laughs> so we got we got four Ubuntu shirts at the start of this event, one clean shirt for every day. Um, and when, when you're at the food stands buying your food, the number of people that were serving me said, oh, I love Ubuntu, or going into the conference, you know, the security guards and the people on the gate saying, oh, I use Ubuntu, and, and people smiling at you from a distance as you're walking along. Uh, and then when you get there, like, oh, you know, I use Ubuntu, or that is walking neat. around in your lunch break and people running up to you and tapping you on the shoulder, you ah, from Ubuntu. Yeah. It, was, it was really great, really great. That was particularly enjoyable. <laughs> Wow. Our work here is done. Yeah, really. Mm-hmm. Now, r- rumor has it that there may be a new episode of the Ubuntu podcast hey. soon to be released that may go into more details. Are, are, are these true rumors? Is this? Can you guys confirm this rumor? 
No. We can confirm oh, those rumors. <laughs> I was scared there yeah. for a second. Yeah, I wonder who was so, going to say anything then? <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Uh, I tell you what. I tell you what. Mark, do you do you want to do you want to explain what we've been doing this evening? Uh, well, we've been recording the Ubuntu podcast, of course. Very good. Probably There's talking a little bit about to say this. Than that. You can, I, you can hear it on uh, on Thursday. Very nice. In fact, Mark, you're here with a little uh, more breaking news. In the uh, unplugged program, uh, I believe another rumor came out on the 26th of February. <laughs> this is a breaking, this is just really late breaking news here. That OggCam 17 is on and a location has been chosen. Are these rumors true? These rumors are extremely true. Not fake news. <laughs> no, not, no. No, we don't do fake news over here. <laughs> or alt facts. Yeah, okay, good one. Yeah, sure. So what's the details? What do I? What are the uh, dirty details that I need to know if I might want to go to OddCamp? So uh, if, you, if you've not heard of OddCamp before, OddCamp is what we call a free culture on conference. So uh, it's a conference with uh, not a lot of schedule, but a lot of room for things if you want to come along and talk about your favorite thing. Um, and it's happening this year after taking a year off on the 19th and 20th of August, and it's happening in Canterbury in the UK. Okay. So we've got um, uh, a building at uh, the Canterbury Christchurch University, and we've also got some accommodation at their student accommodation. We've got a deal with them. Uh, the details of that are on the website at oldcamp.org. And if you go to oldcamp.org, you can also sign up for your ticket um, and as we've have done in previous years, we're doing pay what you want tickets. So you can uh, you can come for free, or you can give us a bit of money if you want to. Nice, I think that's really cool. Odd Camp Seventeen, glad to hear it's back. And I've always heard it's a good event. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh man. One nice thing about the location uh, actually this year is if you're in Europe, um, you can actually get the train quite easily to Canterbury because you just get the Eurostar under the channel, and then you either change in ashford or london and then you can get straight to canterbury from there so uh it might be a bit more accessible than it has been when it's been up in Liverpool, yeah. the other end of the country yeah that is really nice especially for oh i'd love to go oh i gotta get a ticket i gotta i got it well <clears throat> problem number one is i can't believe i'm in my mid-30s and i still don't have my passport so that's a that's something that is problem one it simply comes down to who has the time to do that who has the time to drive around to three different places or whatever it is, get some stupid little picture, and then get it put on another stupid... I don't have and time. And then wait around for it to come. I, my yeah. daughter has had a passport since she was four I years know. old. It, you should be ashamed of I am. I literally Well, we am. only have the one really close neighbor, and you don't need a passport. Right, that's the, the thing. Against driver's license. That is so. the thing. That is, I just go up to Canada with the... And in fact, if you take the boat, you don't even need the enhanced... Oh, I can't... I don't know about that's true anymore, but you didn't used for to. For a long you. time, yeah. Yeah. Um, Just strap some inflatables to the RV. You'll be over in no time. I would, oh, if I could, that'd be so great. I really got to do it. I got to do it. If, I just need a way. I just, this is why I need an assistant to have it, you know, take a picture of me. Go, go do these things. Now, if you want to hear more of these fine gentlemen, check out ubuntupodcast.org. Uh, so this is going to be season 11. Is that what's uh, starting Ten. off? 10. Oh, uh. so it's already up then. No, this yeah. is episode zero, yeah. zero. Oh, it is this already is we We've done episode yeah, zero. zero. This yeah, is zero is the one. Teaser. Oh, you yeah. guys are so confusing Ooh. with the zero zero. So I like it though. It's, it looks good. It looks like just from a title that looks that looks good. But yeah, this is the one that we did. Generated. So the guy who uh, the guy who emailed in season one saying that we were um, we were sort of had ideas above our station for using a leading zero. <laughs> this is the season that proves him wrong. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> not that you guys hold a grudge. <laughs> Certainly not. <laughs> oh, no. I love we're it. Gonna, we're going to churn out 42 episodes just to prove him right. Right. <laughs> well, that might have been in his best interest in the long term. I, I'm, boy, I'm excited about Og Camp. And even if I if I can't make it, I'd love to hear a report back here on the show about it because that uh, does look like it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, you guys going to record a live Ubuntu uh, podcast there? Quite possibly, yeah. We'll have to yeah, it might see happen. What happens. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Okay, well, although I'll... we should we should also mention we are going to be recording a live podcast later in the year on June the twenty fourth in London. Uh, so, Foss Talk Live that happened last August, uh, organised by Joe Ressington from Late Night Linux. He's organising another Foss Talk Live this year, and we are on the bill uh, to do that. So, if Ooh. you head to fosstalklive dot com. When tickets get announced, you'll be able to find the details there and get a ticket for the event. They'll be in very short supply, small venue. It's worth going for the laminated show notes alone. 
Oh yes. Well, yes. And if <laughs> if you're lucky, if you if you make friends with Popey and buy him a beer, he might sign them for you. <laughs> oh, nice. Produced in in Gobi in Gobes, as we used to call it. Uh, so you know, guys, I'm just putting this out there. But if you actually stream the recording of the shows live, some of us would tune in. Just saying, there might be an audience yeah. out there for that. It's not hard. Uh, maybe you, you can do it. You can do it. You don't even have to show your faces. You could just do an audio stream. It'd be really fun. But I know. That does sound fun. I yeah. think one day this whole live stream thing is going to take off. Catch I, on. I, I don't know. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> we've live streamed before. Yeah, but, okay. Um, I think maybe now that we've got a big Telegram channel, we can uh, we can pimp it to them. But before, it was it was more effort than it was worth. I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I You know, doing li- I remember doing live streams before Twitter. And the only real reason I was thankful Twitter kind of came along in some sense was because I had a way to let people know we were live. Really, there was, Otherwise, what were you going to do? There was really no other mechanism. Yeah. And that makes me feel like an old man. All right, so we got to talk about scale. We got to warp back to scale. I got a great interview Ooh. by Noah with the Gnome booth. But before we do that, I want to thank our good friends at Ting for sponsoring the show, linux.ting.com. Linux.ting.com. You go there, you support the show, and get a $25 credit. Now, this $25 credit can be applied to a device you buy from Ting like a maniac, direct from Ting. Why not? Makes it nice and easy. They can even find a device for you. Or if you bring a device, they'll give you $25 in service credits. And you're like, oh, $25? <laughs> that doesn't even pay for the line. What are you, stuck in some sort of duopoly, quote-unquote, agreement? Ting, Ting is mobile. It's different. You only pay for what you use. It's a flat rate. Boom, $6 for the line. That's it. $6. $6. $6, guys, for the line. Are you hearing that? I mean, I could say it one more time, but it's just crazy at that point. And then you just pay for your usage on top of that. <laughs> what? It's that straightforward. You got $6 for the line. Oh, I did it again. Then you pay for what you use. Minutes, messages, megabytes. So if you don't use many messages, you don't pay for them. You don't make a lot of phone calls, you don't pay for it. You see how that works? It's simple. And then it's Uncle Sam's cut right off the top. That's going to depend on where you live, bro. I don't know. I can't put that. Don't put that on me. I don't know. That's what depends on you. Anyways, you find out. You go to linux.ting.com. You click on what would you save. You get a little chart. It starts telling you about numbers. You do the math. You start realizing, holy crap, in two years, I could have bought an entirely new laptop. I'm like three and a half years into this. I got multiple lines. A ton of laptops, too. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm all up in the ting. I got it for myself. I got it for the business. It really makes a lot of sense. And if I ever get stuck, which is really nice when I'm on the road, really good support. Really good. Really good. So good. They they stayed on the phone longer than they should have. I didn't need I did not I did not expect that to get fixed. I th- I was I I legit was done like a half hour 40 minutes before they were. I was like this is unsolvable. This is unsolvable. I don't even I you know, I've been in IT for 15 years. And I can tell you this is unsolvable. You don't need to bother. N- they stuck with it and got it fixed, which was super thankful. Anthrop we was we, we were I was in Montana. Anthrop was stopping by. I was about to do I can't remember which show. I think it might have been Coder. It might have been this show. I was about to go live on the air. My MiFi had died. I didn't know what was going on. I was parked in a gravel parking lot, and Ting saved the day. Linux.ting.com. You go there. You get the best mobile company in the biz. You bring a device. They don't honey badger. They just go crazy. They don't care. They're honey badger about it. You just use it however you want. Minutes, messages, megabytes, and you pay for it. It's simple. Also, I really like this blog series they've been doing. If you go to linux.ting.com, and this is sort of applicable to any carrier, I suppose, but the five capable smartphones under $100. Like, we always talk about, like, you get, like, Wes over here with the Pixel. That's right. Although you did rock the Nexus 5 for, like, ever. Ages. Yeah, so you Ages. totally earned that Pixel. Uh, kind of, you know, you know, if you're not ready to buy... You're not ready to blow $700 on a smartphone or even $1,000 in some Either cases. Either way, it's great about Ting, right? Just yeah. whatever phone you want, yep. whatever phone makes sense totally. for you. Totally. Linux.ting.com. And a big thank you to Ting for sponsoring the Unplugged program. So let's talk to, and well, let's talk, let's talk GNOME. Let's talk Endless. Let's talk Endless PC. And let's talk a little Fedora. Oh, yes. That's right, my friends. It's Noah at scale. <laughs> Walking around the scale floor, we have to stop at GNOME anytime we see him. Obviously, one of the favorite desktop environments of anyone that uses Linux. How are we doing today? Pretty good. How are you? Excellent. So, tell me a little bit uh, about what 
the GNOME team is up to these days. And also, I know that you work for Endless. I would like to hear about Endless, uh, the Endless PC and the operating system that you've designed around GNOME. Yeah, for sure. So um, this is actually good timing because GNOME 324, the new version of GNOME, is going to be out uh, in a couple of weeks. I think March 17th, March 20th, mm -hmm. uh, something like that. And there are some pretty cool features um, in the new version of GNOME, including uh, a night shift filter, like you have, for instance, on your phone that will tint your screen uh, with a natural light uh -huh. uh, at night so that it doesn't strain your eyes as much. Sure. Um, there's a lot of features also for uh, developers. Um, Gnome Builder and Flatpak are uh, two big pieces of our uh, ecosystem, mm -hmm. and they're receiving a lot of new features for 324. And um, Christian is right here behind me, mm -hmm. busy writing code on Gnome Builder right now. <laughs> really, right at the conference, he's coding. Yes, he's right there. <laughs> uh, nice. yeah. Excellent. So I know that you work for Endless PC, and you guys have designed a very interesting operating system okay. around Gnome. Might one might even say that it's like the anti-cloud operating system. It runs so. <laughs> offline, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's actually one of our core tenants at Endless. We um, we were uh, the company was born a few years ago with the mission of bringing computers really to the whole world population, to as many people as possible. And uh, uh, there's really two barriers mm -hmm. uh, to doing that, and one is the price of the hardware, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why you know you see here some of the computers that we've made. They're pretty affordable. Mm -hmm. uh, they're nice. They're very compatible with Linux. They run very very well. Uh, you turn them on, and you know everything is ready for you. Mm -hmm. The other um, barrier, typical barrier, is the access to internet. So the cost of connectivity or the access to connectivity at all. Mm -hmm. So we bundled inside the OS a lot of features um, for consumption of content offline. So we want to almost bring a lot of the value of internet into the box itself. So when you buy it, it will come preloaded with something like 150 uh, offline applications on a variety of topics that you normally would Google things for, sure, like, yeah. such as farming, uh, encyclopedia, or uh, math, or physics, or biology, or all these things. Um, so it's a, it, it's a really good value for, for mm -hmm. people that don't otherwise have access to that information uh, the same way that we do here. Nice, yeah. excellent. If people were interested in, in Endless, what is, the, what is, the, what is the, uh, the, the compelling use for the operating system if I didn't have an Endless PC, can I, just, can I go get the operating system? And what kind of people here in the U.S. where we do have an abundant internet, where are those, what is, that, what is your target audience here, if any? Uh, yeah, so that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. We launched actually this hardware line specifically for the U.S. market uh, this year. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can buy these from our website, endlessos.com, and also you can uh, download a free, uh, the free operating system from there. So you can download the exact OS mm -hmm. that you would find inside um, the box mm -hmm. uh, for free from our website. Uh, here in the United States, you're right, uh, internet connection is much better. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not, that's not true everywhere. Sure. So even inside the United States, right. there's a lot of places where that is useful, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, even in California, there's a lot of remote areas where internet just doesn't get there because there's right. not enough people. So if you live in one of those areas, this could be useful for you. Another interesting use case that we really had not thought about before when when we when we designed this, but it turns out it's it's a pretty good match, is actually uh, prisons. So they. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of people there that have time and they uh, want to study, they want to learn new right. things, but they cannot access internet as a matter of policy, of uh -huh. course. So uh, we're doing some uh, pilots with uh, prison systems uh, in a few states in the U.S. Uh -huh. to see if this is a good match for them. Outstanding, and how's that working so far? Uh, it's been working pretty well, yeah. The, the, the feedback that we've, that we've received is pretty good. Uh, there were some uh, things like we were shipping, for instance, Open Arena, which is a slightly violent game. We had to remove it. So there's, okay. you know, you have to adjust sure. things for specific for the use case. But uh, it, it's been working well so far. Outstanding. And so, and you're providing the machines, the hardware, the software. I mean, that's a story right in of itself that you guys are are reaching out to to, to these people that are, you know, that are you know, in some ways underprivileged and 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 providing them with 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 skills and, and abilities that they can use if and when they ever leave the the, the the prison system, they can become functioning adults 
adults back into society and they will know how to use a, a computer system. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So, yeah, in, in some cases we've donated hardware. Uh, in other cases we've partnered with associations that were already working in the prison and um, we installed it on the computers that they already had. So, Endless is... At the end of the day, like another uh, Linux-based OS is compatible with the whole variety of hardware that you know other distros like Ubuntu or Fedora are compatible with. So you can run it on anywhere. Take a given that you also have a Fedora laptop. Uh, is have you found that Fedora is a is is a is a good operating system for exemplifying GNOME? Uh, absolutely. I think Fedora is um, one of the distros that always strives to uh, give the vanilla GNOME user experience to the user. And actually in Fedora 25, uh, which is what we have on the laptop there, it's the first distro that I know of that ships with Wayland by default. So, uh, you know, we've been waiting for this moment kind of for many, many years, the, the point where we stopped using X, and it's, it's there. And I, I have to be honest, I didn't even notice that I was using Wayland until maybe, you know, two weeks later if I saw some like minor bugs, but it is really, really polished. It's, it's a really great distro. That's, that's fantastic. And so you personally use Fedora on your computer? Uh, yeah, I have, my, on my work computer I use Endless, but my personal right. computer I use Fedora, yeah. Nice, <laughs> that's that's outstanding. And so, has, is en you have to forgive my ignorance, is Endless a rolling release or is it a, is, are they static builds? Um, Endless is, um, it has a th about a three month release release cycle, so we have uh, major quote unquote updates every three cycles. So we go from uh, version 3.1 to 3.2 to 3.3. Three, three. Uh, and then we have point releases about every three weeks to a month, depending on exactly why we need to make a point release. Sometimes there are critical bugs to be fixed, so we have to you know make it quicker. Um, but no, new features only get out every two or three months. It's not really released. Now tell me, uh, what was the design thought behind this idea of on the screen here we have, you can see where like these icons are in the center, and if I if I click down, you know, here there's like a traditional menu structure, but we have occupied the majority of the desktop space with application shortcuts, and interestingly enough, you know, we started back in the 90s where we had a bunch of things cluttering the desktop, and then we kind of went away from that, but the reality is now like, on my GNOME machine, I, it just, I just have a pretty picture. It's really wasted a desktop real estate, and you've, you've actually taken that up with useful shortcuts, almost kind of like in between a dock. Tell me about that. Yeah, so the idea for the icon grid specifically um, is to be familiar for users that are used to smartphones and tablets. So that's actually how you know your Android launcher or your iOS uh, application list uh, works. So endless the desktop works similarly. You cannot put your files on the desktop. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really the launching page for all of your apps. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to start with a minimal uh, number of apps on the desktop so that the user is uh, invited to explore the app center, mm -hmm. uh, which is based on GNOME software, where you can you know, add more apps to your desktop or download more things uh, from the internet, download more bundles, and expand your uh, list of available apps. Basically, outstanding. Uh, if if people were interested in more uh, information about GNOME or Endless, uh, where could they go? So endlessos.com is the uh, Endless website. From there, you can find everything. There's uh, also uh, forums and a Slack community uh, if you're interested in participating. Um, for GNOME, uh, GNOME.org is our main website, um, and uh, you can also find us on IRC, uh, irc.gnome.org, and um, the GNOME Wiki has a lot of information about. Uh, the release and you know the whole release process if you're interested uh, in contributing back. So uh, wiki.gnome.org, but gnome.org is the main homepage. Outstanding. Cosmo, gnome.org, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate having you. Thank you. Thank you. That Endless PC is actually pretty interesting because yeah. they got this mission now. Uh, the Mission One is a gorgeous Linux-powered desktop, handsome. they say. Yeah, and it's like got a bamboo case, which has always kind of pushed my buttons. Yeah. The wood PC cases have always kind of done it for me. Uh, and I haven't really tried out Endless OS yet, but after that interview, I was a little more tempted to maybe go give the ISO a download. So the uh, Mission One is uh, $250, and you can either get it with 320 gigabytes of storage or 500 gigabytes of storage. And I don't remember, do they have the, uh, <clears throat> oh yeah, here it is. Yeah. It's an Intel Celeron uh, N2807 in it. It's got uh, two gigabytes of DDR3 RAM. So that's kind of your base performance metrics. Then it's got 
two USB 2.0 ports, one USB 2.0 port. Hopefully so one of those three. Is three. <laughs> so three USB ports, maybe, or maybe one of those. Actually, it's a typo. They meant to write USB 3.0. VGA, HDMI out, uh, uh, headphone jack, Ethernet, built-in Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth. I guess, um, you know, for 250 bucks, that's that's not too bad. That's not too bad. Um, and they really are, you know, you listen to that guy, they really got an idea, a philosophy behind this. And uh, I kind of thought I'm not always a big fan of yet another derivative of GNOME, but right. I, I, I don't know what I don't know how much they've I don't know how extended of GNOME it is. I, I from what I did I did a little reading, a little research for the show. It looks like it's based on a slightly newer, or I'm sorry, slightly older version of GNOME. I want to say three two zero, but I'm not positive. It was somewhere in that range. Interesting. So it's 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 a fork, or at least as a layer of extensions on top of GNOME three. I'm not quite sure, uh, but it did look very usable. So I, I I might be uh, I might be giving the endless the endless ISO a download. I'm trying to think of like who in my life would would or could use that, but I suppose if you're just really using web apps and you know you don't want a big ugly weird box in your nicely decorated living room or computer room that it sits nicely on a desk, I guess I could see that. Yeah, I think yeah, I think if you had yeah, I could see a lot of family members that yeah, I could see a lot of people. Uh, Why we're talking about gnome. See, I'm giving a little gnome love because we've yeah. been talking. Are you still using Plasma, by the way? Yep. All right, we should talk about that. But uh, there's also a write-up at fedoramagazine.org on getting more out of gnome notifications, which is a thing. Gnome notifications, which are not bad. Not bad at all, my friend. And uh, with a few tweaks, maybe a few extensions or things like that, you can get uh, even more, incl- including creating your own notifications. Nice. For, like things on the command line. So that's also linked in the show notes. So Wes, uh, did you end up uh, playing around with like controlling where the screens go or your where, where your windows go on your screen based on keyboard commands? I know that was something you A were... little bit. I have a list of things to try that I have not gotten to. So I, I started playing with it. I got a couple things set up. Um, but there's a couple plugins and settings that have been recommended to me that I have not gotten around to trying yet. There's some stuff that's a little more replic- replicate some of the stuff that i3 or similar does. Uh, so I'm looking forward to extend it more or see if it can meet my needs because I'm really liking a lot of the other stuff. <laughs> the one thing that I keep messing up though, I'm used to like when I have the lock screen on GNOME, I have to hit enter and then I type it. You don't have to, but I'm just used to doing it. But if you do that on the Plasma lock screen, boom, now I have the timeout. To yeah. So I have to like yes. unlearn some things. So, but I'm trying to, I want to stick with it long enough that those things have all gone away and I can give it really a, a better understanding of if it works for me. So my, I had two things this week with, the, with my adventures with Plasma and uh, I thought they were both noteworthy for mentioning here on the show. Uh, I finally got a chance to getting around to play with uh, KDE Connect because I'm back on Android and back on my Nexus 6P. And so I just took advantage of, I was like, well, this is one more way I can use oh, the Plasma yeah. desktop now. I really like that. I, I really do like it. Um, I'm not so sure if I want notifications that are showing up on my Android device, showing up on my desktop yet. I'm still like mm-hmm. feeling that out. But just some of the basic functionality, it's it really feels like 2017. Yeah. I mean, it's nice. Um, and it's so much more practical than what I seemed to grok with the, uh, like that, the iOS functionality. I guess maybe iOS, I don't know if there's a way to like share your clipboard with the Mac desktop. With where with their handoff stuff, but That's I know you question. can like open up like links and web pages, but it's it's not nearly as nice as like it is with KDE Connect. KDE Connect is it is, seems very thoughtfully made. It's one of those things that would make me want to stay on Android. Mm-hmm. Um, We're also working on iOS support. Oh really? Well, there you go. I wonder if it'll be nearly as functional. Yeah, that's something to watch. Yeah, because it's it's always running on the phone, right? It's you can get it from the Play Store and. Uh, then the other thing, the other just sort of noteworthy ab- adventures with Plasma this week would be I decided to set up the MacBook Pro that we set up months ago on the show yeah. running Arch. I've switched that over to the Plasma desktop from GNOME. Uh, hey, yeah. And this was my first time setting up Plasma desktop on a high DPI display where everything was high DPI by default. How did that go? I'm curious. I, I, I It was great. I think I tweaked the mouse cursor a bit, but on all my previous installations of Plasma, on a high DPI display. I've always, my first, inst- that right after install, it's everything's tiny. It's all really tiny. Mm-hmm. And you got to go into the settings and you got to you gotta turn up the scale and turn bit. up the font DPI and you yeah. got to change, you know, uh, some of your window sizes. I did still have strange windows that like rendered way too small, like, like the size of a 640 by 480 resolution, just tiny little window that I have to resize to see the entire UI. But out of the box, after I installed Plasma Desktop, just... Logged out and logged into the Plasma desktop, and everything was high DPI. I didn't have to change a damn thing. That's awesome. It is. It is really nice to see him going that direction. So I still. So I guess my my take is I'm getting deeper into the Plasma ecosystem. 
now with KDE Connect. And uh, I've put Plasma Desktop on my main driver at home, the uh, the, the MacBook. MacBook run an Arch with now Plasma. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I haven't really I haven't really felt a need to reinstall and go to like KDE Neon or yeah or so Solus or whatever. But the same thing on our little yeah little machines. Interesting. Yeah, and uh, Plasma Five Ten is just around the corner. Cheryl. Sure. Hey, that's good. Cheryl. Sure. Yeah, Cheryl. Sure. All right, let's talk about the Lightbook. Uh, I think uh, producer Michael's been following this one pretty closely. I'd like to get his his thoughts on it because it seems like a pretty good deal, but is it too good to be true? I'll tell you about something that's great, and it is true. That's DigitalOcean. Go over to DigitalOcean.com and use our promo code DLUnplugged. You apply it after you create your account. You get a $10 credit. You support the show, and you can play with our $5 rig two months for free. DigitalOcean.com, use our promo code D-O-Unplugged, take advantage of their all-SSD-based cloud. Their lightning-fast networking with 40 gigabit connections coming right into them hypervisors. Oh, those hypervisors? Yeah, they run Linux. They use KVM for the virtualizer, pow. You got Linux for the base operating system, SSDs for all the disk I.O., 40 gigabit E connections, data centers all over the world in choice locations, highly available block storage, which you can attach up to 16 terabytes. Love it. And an interface... The interface is beautiful. It's the best interface. It's huge. It's great. It is so well done, and it doesn't matter if you're a total noob, like you barely even understand that web servers are a thing and that you need a website, you could manage to use this. To somebody who's been setting up virtual servers for literally their entire career will find this to be a great interface. How do they do it? I think they're from the future. Yeah. I can't really, I can't square it otherwise. Either that or they had this great API. And they're like, damn, this API is so dank that we need an interface that comes close to being as dank as our, as our API. That's the only two things I can figure. I can only, it's, all, it's either they're from the future or that dank API is so dank they had to have a dank interface. That's the only thing I can figure. So you got to check it out yourself, digitalocean.com. Use the promo code DO on plug, spin up a rig, try out a different Linux distro, maybe go outside your comfort zone. What? You're so important you can't go outside your comfort zone? Try it. They also now have load balancers, monitoring service coming soon you can sign up for. Holy smokes, DigitalOcean, look like a pro. And use our promo code D-O-Unplugged. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring this on here, this here, right now, Unplugged Program. So the light book, is it a scam? Is it a total scam? Is it from 2014? For $249, they say you can get a 32 gigabyte MSATA drive. Or you can pay a little more and get up to 512 gigabytes of storage. They say it's got Linux by default elementary OS at that, a 1080p display, 4 gigabytes of RAM, and an Intel Celeron quad-core processor. Hmm. hmm. 250 bucks. That seems to be the new sweet spot. Yeah, right? Everybody's trying to hit 250 bucks. And uh, the, th- only, the only thing that's weird about this, outside from just the things I've noticed, just looking at this... All of the product images are totally gimped. There's no, there's no real shots of the computer. But it looks like you can also find this exact image with like a, a video game gimped into it, or, or probably in this case it was Photoshop. Uh, just probably, I would assume, running Windows. Just the exact same product shot, just a different complete operating environment on the screen going back for years now. It's, so that's a little weird. That's that a little concerning. Weird, yeah. But but maybe, but maybe, but maybe what they're doing is they're taking something that's been around since 2014, they're rebranding it, and because it's fairly old, the margins are super low, so they can sell it for 250 bones. That's the reasonable take. But uh, producer Michael, you've been sniffing around. What's your take? Do you think it's a scam? Do you think there's something else going on here, or is this a legit rig? Uh, I have no idea. It's uh, it's more the thing of uh, it looks really promising, mm. but it feels a little sketchy with with the photos, with the fact that uh, there is no name associated to the company. Like there's no person's name when you go to their forum. It just says director as the person replying. Like there's absolutely no name. There's no photos. There's one video on YouTube where it shows a person's face because he's recording the la- the light book with his phone. And then the reflection of the of him is in the in the screen. So it's it's just it's just kind of, it feels weird. But like the photos thing, uh, every photo that's on their website ex- except for the the software photos, but all the product photos are also on like Alibaba and stuff like that. Um, I, I it just seems odd that they're not being more you know transparent about the company structure, but. I mean, I found out they are supposedly uh, located in Tampa, Florida, 
and that's where they ship from. So there's no international shipping uh, for U.S. people. Mm. And the price, the, like I found out what the processor is. It's a 3050 Celeron, which is a pretty good Celeron. Um, it's be- it's better than a Chromebook's norm- t- typical uh, processor. 3150, um, right? The 3150. I th- yeah, I think 3150. I don't remember exactly the number, but I'm pretty sure it's 3150. So it's a decent. Yeah, it's 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 better than the average Chromebook. Um, no, there's a couple things I tell you that, to, and I think this came out via Reddit posts, and, and they were replying to people's questions. A couple of things that are odd. So they asked, well, is Elementary OS getting a cut of the sales? A pretty reasonable question for a laptop mm-hmm. featuring Elementary OS. And the que- the response at first was, well, yeah, about 2 to $4. And then and then when people asked a little bit further, it turns out, well, it kind of depends on bugs and we run into because we're actually well, going to be doing this via the, the bug. bounty source. Yeah, they're going to do it via bug bounty, the bounty source. Like, uh, so okay, so they're not getting the cut of each laptop. You're you're just going to use their bug bounty system if you make some profits. Okay, all right, okay. So then it turns out, well, oh, are you, is this really elementary OS or are you modifying this? No, 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 we're not modifying it except for, well, we have updated the kernel to kernel 4.8. We've pre-installed Play on Linux. Also, Kingsoft Office and uh, Firefox is now the default web browser. But otherwise, it's stock elementary OS. I, honestly, I didn't see them saying that they didn't modify it. Every time I someone, someone, ask, someone ask a question about modifying it, they say, they give a list of everything they've done. Oh, I was told they denied it at first, but okay, yeah, I I, I, yeah, there's also there's there's articles out that are reviewing it. They're acting like he deliberately ignored. Uh, no, he didn't. It's in it's in another thread. Like, yeah, so you, you go through. There's the a couple line. of them you go through, and it's you know a lot of it is just odd stuff. Nothing that jumps out at you. It's just odd stuff. And you the thing is that happens yeah. with something like this is is you you really have to kind of. I just think we've all experienced like. The Kickstarter that's gone wrong, or the GoFundMe or Indiegogo that's yeah. gone wrong, and so everybody has to go. Everybody has to go total skeptical mode when they see this stuff. So I'm not actually. I don't. I don't actually want to well, put them down too much, but it does seem to me like they're. If anything, their responses what, what, what we, are okay though. Like the, okay. the stuff they keep saying. Like if you go to their forums, the the way they're doing it is sketchy. The responses they give well, are but, a Rod, kind of promising. At, at, at best case, what we what we have here is a 2014 laptop that's been rebranded. Right, and then they're they're just selling that with some support. I think is probably is what's probably what's happening. I don't know if the laptop is is like manufactured in 2014 or is it like that model was first released in 2014. Mm. I, I couldn't mm. find information about that or not. That's just what one of the articles said was okay. like 2014 is from there. Like, well, yeah, but they could have just you know reiterated it. Uh, but I don't know. It's hard to tell on those on like sure. Alibaba's subscriptions because they're all like buzzword heavy. So what but, what um, was it that set off red lights for you then? It was it wasn't like it wasn't like a red light thing. It was just like um, all of this stuff together is sketchy. Like if it was one of these things, I would if like if it was just the Alibaba thing, but they're like presenting it and marketing it very well, and they have a lot of information about who's running it and all this other stuff. I wouldn't care because you know rebranding things like people do that with Clevo all the time. Mm-hmm. So it's not that big of a deal. So if if that's all they were doing, it's just like all of these things combined feel weird. So like they could have just said we don't have product photos that are genuine yet because we don't have a photographer and we're not good. Oh, we have a camera phone and that's probably not a good way to present your products. You know that kind. They could have done that. Uh, There's there's plenty of options they could have done to make me feel not so iffy about the issue. But it's just like if you go to their YouTube channel, they have like weird videos that are weird. Uh, One of the videos is like vertical uh, recording with the phone vertically. And then also horizontally. So like they started a video vertical, realized it was vertical, and then turned it horizontal, yet the video is still <laughs> vertical. So it's really awkward. Love it. I love uh, that. It's, yeah, it's just that kind of weirdness that makes me feel weird. But like if I could play with a laptop, I would definitely do that. Because if, if they had like, you know, yeah. review units or something they could send out, that would be, be cool. But yeah. That would probably be, that would be the real way to tell. Uh, well, you know what I guess, uh, the other thing I would say, Michael, is it, Sort of, sort of was an indication to me the total lack of enthusiasm or plugging or hype coming from Elementary OS, which would seem to suggest that they're not on board with this. Well, I mean, they they definitely aren't like involved in the situation. So, I mean, I wouldn't try to promote it if they if if I didn't know about it as much either. But um, they were aware that it was happening before it was announced. So um, they weren't like. They were just denying involvement. They're not denying what they're not. They don't have any assessment whether it's good or not. They're just basically mm-hmm. staying out of the situation. Yeah, it and seems I like understand. They 
Yeah, I understand why they're doing it, but I also don't think it's a big deal that they are. Like, it, like a lot of so- companies aren't. You know, Ubuntu is not. You know, advocating for specific uh, products and stuff like that. Mm. They'll say they'll give you a list about what works and what what, what doesn't. Things yeah. like that. But I I agree. Like, technically, you know, you're right, wise. and from a licensing standpoint, you're correct. I would think though that if any distribution out there is going to be hypersensitive to their exactly. product being, because look, think about who's who really loses here is the customer, and that sucks for elementary OS because it, who's going to want something like this is going to be an elementary OS enthusiast, but they're not actually getting elementary OS. They're getting something that ships a different kernel, a different browser, and other things that have been modified to it. So it's not something actually supported by the elementary OS project. So if they if it's an elementary OS fan, they're actually they're getting it's a disservice, and that's got to piss off. I would think. Daniel, I would think that well, I wouldn't it's, be happy about that. It's a bit unusual. So there's been a few uh, vendors that have shipped Ubuntu Mate on their laptops, sure, sure. Uh, mo- most notably Entroware, but a few others around Europe as well. And they've all had the courtesy to get in touch and express their intent to do this and just make sure it's okay. Now, our preferred Ubuntu Mate's preferred vendor is Entroware but there are others there's Slimbooks and Tuck something or other in Germany I forget the name Um, and they're all selling Ubuntu Mate and they're adhering to the terms of the um, Ubuntu trademark requirements which is they ship the vanilla image so I could understand why elementary would feel a bit put out by having a device probably piggybacking off of elementary's brand to ship a product without this, actually involving them is this a chinese vendor by any chance this white thing that i'm looking at on your youtube well, channel it sounds like uh it sounds like yeah you thought they're the out of florida manufacturer is a chinese company is a chinese okay community. yeah the builder but the the company who is selling it as the light book uh, that are also rebranding it because so, so I'm, they they must have a deal because there is like you know label like branding etched onto the laptop. So that's, in one of the videos you can see them says Alpha on the back of it, and that's the name of their company, Alpha Lightbook. But where are they based? So, they're in Tampa, huh? Tampa, Florida. But they haven't like that's all I could find out uh, because it says they ship from there, but I haven't found like you know a business address or anything like that. So it's. It's weird. Ooh, they have the elementary logo on the site too. Yeah, well, this I mean, just feels like the same the same kind of thing that you get from any like Alibaba Chinese vendor who um, just picks up a piece of software, sticks it on a device, and ships it out the door at the lowest possible price. And this seems this is a, this is a lot different because in the the Reddit AMA they did, where people asked a lot of different questions, and the, every question they you know responded to was. You know, the, the, the responses were very promising. For example, they asked about what processor it was. They gave the details. They asked about if it's possible to get bigger RAM. Like, well, no, it's a, it's a you know, SD RAM type. Uh, they were asking, like, is the battery replaceable? Is the hard drive replaceable? And, like, they were listing about how to replace the things. Like, it, it wasn't like... They even got to the point where someone said, well, what if I want to have a different icon set like Mocha? And they said, put it in your order and we'll add it for you. So it's it. they are very attentive in the sense of the questions that are asked and if you go to the forum they're also very attentive to that yeah in fact they say here in one of the in the ama uh somebody says did you make this laptop as the post claims or are you just reselling somebody else's machine with elementary os pre-installed and a uh, lightbook team who's been answering all the questions from lightbook says we are buying it at business to business prices and then selling it with our logo engraved higher specs, and on a modified version of elementary OS, the majority of laptops made by smaller companies are just straight-up resells, uh, just like ours. It's part of an OEM, and then they talk about the Windows keyboard key. It's part of the OEM keyboard. They'd have to order a certain amount from their supplier in order not to have the Windows key on there. So it's, yeah, it's kind of like exactly what I think you were speculating. Yeah, and they also said that uh, someone was like, well, that's unfortunate that you can't get rid of the key, but they said every laptop comes with a sticker of elementary OS on it. Um. So in, in a way, they're they're they are addressing stuff. It's just like their marketing needs work. I would say that what what jumps out at me seem okay. What jumps out at me as a um, systemic problem would be if your product depends on elementary OS to sell. It is in your best interest and longevity to work with elementary OS, just like Entraware works 
with Wimpy because it's in their best interest for the project to know about you and like you because they want to sell more products, theoretically. And so if you well, do not— Well, to be fair, we don't know if they contacted Elementary and Elementary said no or not. Cause yeah, you're right, although I'm pretty, I'm pretty much—I would be willing to make a bet that, yeah, I— yeah. I mean, I agree with I agree with your bet. I'm just saying, like, we don't know for sure, and yeah, yeah. it does feel sketchy. But like, the responses they keep making on Reddit, they still continue to respond to Reddit questions, and on their forum, you can go and leave a question, and they'll, you know, that's good. They, so they that's a good really time. quickly. It's like it, it's it's as far as like you know sales uh, in customer service type approach, they're very good at responding, and they're very. Uh, open and they're not trying to pretend about like different things. They're not trying to be like, you know, a, a, a fake company, like a fake Chinese company using Chinese products and just, you know, pretending that it's a new thing. They are admitting what they're doing. It's just their mark, the way their marketing feels really sketchy because there's like no one associated to it. There's no, like, there's no original photos, but th they do actually show the video engraved, the, the laptop engraved. So it is. Like their claims are legitimate, they have proof of that, but it's just feels. I don't know. It still feels sketchy. I, I if I had yeah. a spare two fifty, I totally would try it. I think I also agree with the beard in the chat room. He says, you know, the, the thing is, is how much of a discount could they really be getting with the expected amount of sales numbers they're going to get? These are probably going to be under a thousand easily, I would say. But who knows? But even let's just say it was five thousand, they're not going to get some sort of massive discount. So where is the room for profit? So well, what that if you look seems at Alibaba, this they have like if you can get 150 with uh, you can get a laptop those laptops at a, th at a buying at a quantity of 300 you can get them for 150. So I saw there's another problem then because that's that's too e that's 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 too easily accessible too. There's this is this is not a well, we don't know if that's actually what they're doing. I just know I just saw that myself. They, it might actually be better for them. I don't know if they do it yeah. in a bigger. Yeah, they bulk. say you know they're saying they're buying they're saying they're you know they are buying business to business and getting some sort of bulk discount. That's all they've said. Uh, I would be wage. I'd be willing to wager if I was going to be looking at this, and this is something I'd be, you know, this would be part of my calculus. Would be they're probably not going to sell tens of thousands of these things, so they're probably not getting some astronomical discount, right. and they don't seem to be directly working with Elementary OS, so they don't seem to have a clear path to profit, and they don't seem to have a good relationship with the distribution they're shipping. They're also not, uh, as as Michael's talking about, they're not really presenting a human face, right? That yeah. you can become excited about. Yeah understand the motivation, you know, so we're left to speculate. But here's something that I have learned over the years, and this is where I kind of give them some room, is when you are just setting up, like I go back to the purism folks, when you're just getting set up with this, it is, there is so many little things that you have to get just right for a product like this that it can take a company a few times of trying this before they really start to fire on all cylinders. And this could be their first foray into this area. I, I know Lightbook is... Uh, I mean, I, I guess it's available now, isn't it, actually? I think you can – I think they say order now at least. So I, I guess they are shipping it. So it is, it's, a, it's a product. It's going to get out there. They'll have, yeah. they'll have customer feedback, and we'll see if they iterate on it. I, I am, it's ship, enough to uh, pique my to interest. Days. $250 to $270, depending on your amount of storage. That's, a, you know, that's, that's, enough, that's enough to kind of pique my interest and go, there might be something here that's worth, to, worth discussing. But – it, oh, you can get it in black. There you go, oh, Wes. I know how you like everything red in black. And white. Ooh, really? You got to get one of each. Got to get. I mean, if you're a real patron. No, there's a there's a white, there's a black, and there's a uh, one that's got white base and black. Uh, I mean, re a red back of the LED LED, LED I mean, screen. This is pretty great. You I mean you could, in theory, you walk away with a laptop with 540 gig, 40 gigabyte, 544 gigs of quote unquote hybrid storage, which I assume is spinning with a on with solid a little bit of solid state. No. No, no, it's it's two different drives. One one M M dot two SATA uh, uh, array gig SSD, and they're set they're set as the they're set at dill boot. I'm not sure how hmm. they've structured it, but one is, is they're basically they're saying hybrid approach, but it's not a hybrid drive. It's two different drives. One SSD that's 32, and one that's the hard drive that's 500. Yeah, they call it hybrid storage. Okay, so that's where you get the 544 gigs. Um, and so for all of that, so whatever, like RAID or whatever they're using to pull that off, for that and a black one that's, you know, got a decent Celeron quad core in it, um, $283. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty yeah. amazing deal. And when I'm looking especially, at... Yeah. The you know, specs wise, especially that it's it's a 1080, it's a full 1080p. And yeah, I like that. Yeah. 1366. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's better than a Chromebook. 
Uh, twice now, as much RAM as a Chromebook. Did, hey, Dan, they take Bitcoin. Damn it. Oh, <laughs> let's just put it in danger territory. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> that's interesting. Huh. Yeah, that's a... Uh, yeah. Something to watch. There was, mm-hmm. there was someone on Reddit that said that they were going to buy it to do a, blo- a review on their blog. So... Uh, <sighs> I'll, I'll I'll try to like you know bookmark that. So yeah. They, they okay. Do it. Yeah. Maybe follow. I'm keep following it for us. Maybe you know because it'd be interesting to see if they actually turn this into something. You know, maybe yeah. they'll actually turn this thing into a real product. Maybe they'll get to the point where they'll their the elementary OS project is comfortable working with them. And maybe they have to get to a point where they're substantial and demand the attention of elementary OS before. And maybe it's who right. knows. I don't know. They should they should just give me a call and I'll help them with the marketing too. There you go. There, there you go. go. Find them. He's in the mumble room. <laughs> yeah, easy to find. Uh, I'm going to give a real quick plug before we run for Linux Fest Northwest coming up soon, May 6th and 7th. I'll be there. Wes will be there. It's going to be a hell of a show. I think I think right now, uh, after, after reviewing our adventures at scale this year and kind of looking at the news that came out from scale, I think it's safe to say there may be a new contender for the number one Linux event in the United States run by the community. I'm not saying it's going to be necessarily as big as something maybe the Linux Foundation could put on. Right. But as far as run by the community, free to freaking attend with a great venue and great talks, I think we may have a new pack leader stepping up. This is – this. Is so. I mean, I am so happy. I'm so happy. I mean, I've, Scale, I, I'm sure they'll pull things around too. They'll, they're going to they're gonna get that live stream taken care of and that whole – Attendance thing figured out. They're going to get it pulled around. I, I believe in them, but I think this might be this might be Linux Fest year right here. 2017 is the year to go. I am really looking forward to it. Noah and I are already rubbing our hands together, uh-huh. making plans. Yeah, we've oh, <laughs> very excited about it. You can find out more at linuxfestnorthwest.org, and uh, we'll have a booth there. We'll have swag there. We'll be doing a live show from there. We'll be doing an after party in there. We may do all kinds of things. So check it out. If you can make it, we'd love to see you at linuxfestnorthwest.org. All right. That's going to bring us to an end of the show. I wanted to say thank you to the live stream for making it this week. You can find the show over at jblive.tv on a Tuesday. In fact, if you show up, you get a little extra because after this, it's the TechSnap program. It's like the pre-show for That's TechSnap. That's right. Here. It's the pre-show right Just here. Just a warm-up. For... Yeah, we're warming up. We're warming up. Mm-hmm. Uh, find Wes on the Twitter, at Wes Payne. That's right. You can also find Mr. Wimpy, Mark, and Popey, and the Ubuntu podcast at ubuntupodcast.org. Follow myself, at Chris LAS. Get our live times at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. Submit content to the show at linuxactionshow.reddit.com and get your emails at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash Contact. And last but not least, if you're still listening on YouTube, smash that like button because, come on, long form content needs your love. Right? Right? Right. See you back here next week. Goodbye, buddy! Awesome. Thank you, everybody in the mumble room. Yeah, it was great yeah, to yeah. have both Popey and Wimpy back. It's nice to hear from Mr. Lunduke. Now we got to go pick our titles. <laughs> go get your titles. Um. And then Mr. West has got to get his business up in here. You know what I'm saying? That's right. Alexa, turn on JB1. Uh, so jbtitles.com. JB. Oh, my God. God. That is bright. Hey, so that reminds me of um, the Cody Android situation in, in a way. It's not exactly similar, but it reminds me of that. Hmm. Yes, Mr. Poppy. Hey, Chris. Uh, so uh, a couple of things I didn't want to mention on the show, but I thought I'd tell you now. Um, there was a Red Hat booth at MWC as well, and uh, loads of our guys went over there because they had some of the best coffee at MWC. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Good on you. Yeah.